Romeo, Romeo. <laughs> Which, as you all know, is Finnish for Achtung, Achtung. I thought we'll start with Finnish. Uh, it'll get everyone nicely confused. <laughs> Just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, you've got to start somewhere, haven't you, James? Um, <laughs> often it's the, it's the first step of every journey that's the most important. Welcome to We Have Ways to Make You Talk, the World War II podcast that makes the Enigma Code seem easily decipherable. So, for the last three episodes, we were embedded at the Tank Museum in Bobbington, but today we've turned to a command post at the heart of West London. Now. Otherwise known as my kitchen. <laughs> By the way, if you're new to this lark, I am Al Murray, professional comedian, part-time history sleuth. Uh, and I'm James Holland, professional historian and part-time cricketer, although <laughs> I quite like to be full-time. <laughs> Are you good enough? No. Oh. I wish. Yeah, I wish. well, you know, we've all dreams of other things, haven't we, James? That's the yes, that's true. tragic truth. Right, then. Well, okay. I have got a Spitfire cricket bat. You see, I do, and it has a Spitfire on the back. It has, you know, the shape, the wings. It's got sort of rondels on the thicker edges that you get on cricket mats these days. Of course, it has. Right then, our last three episodes all concentrated on different aspects of the Normandy campaign, um, which, by incredible coincidence, James has a book out about. And although we've only really touched the surface of that extraordinary episode, we're planning to widen out a little this week, break out of our Normandy lodgement, as it were. Get airborne now. Yeah, get airborne. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've been going on about air power for absolutely ages. Yeah, we're not. We've we're, yeah, we're, got, to, got to get it off my chest. We'll talk about it in the end. <laughs> yeah. But first, Al, some correspondence, uh, which I thought might be fun to read out. Um, remember to get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag WeHaveWays. Many of you have already done so, and we've been hugely enjoying some great debate and there's lots of fascinating fascinating stuff along the way but how about this one from francis heritage who writes each 6th of june i remember my grandfather who went up sword beach as an rmp traffic control corporal he slowly advanced towards the enemy waving elbow length white gloves imagine if neither side had traffic control blitzkrieg and d-day could have been the biggest traffic jams ever well i mean the the traffic control incredibly important to all this (laughs) it's road signs blokes pointing in the right direction all these i mean these are all the things you don't think of that, that obviously this kind of uh, the massive organisations needed. So yeah, absolutely, and, and the whole Second World War nearly came to a crashing end in the Ardennes Forest in May um, 1940, between the 11th and 12th of May, when there was the biggest military traffic jam in the history of military tra- traffic jams, as Army Group A were passing their 10 Panzer divisions and uh, Panzer Grenadier divisions through the Ardennes. And what happened, there wasn't enough roads. And the infantry weren't very keen on this. They didn't like these sort of upstart sort of panzer types. So they started cutting in on them. And, and what happened there was it was just sort of toe-to-bumper kind of traffic jam going on. And these you know, French reconnaissance pilots are flying over and reporting back and saying, um, I've just looked down and it looks like you know, there's a whole German army is going through the Ardennes forest. <laughs> you know, what, what about sending some bombers over? Uh, and the French commanders went, no, it's not possible. The Ardennes impassable. It's impassable and impossible. <laughs> it's impossible That's, and impossible. But the thing is, is the Ardennes, I mean, I'm, a, I'm strictly an amateur. The Ardennes is the high ground that gets you over the Meuse, right? I'm not a I'm not. It's the obvious. It's obvious that that's where you'd come through. Yeah, especially but especially with the Maginot Line, it's blindingly obvious that that's where you push through. Well, it's also. It's, it's, I mean, you know, where where the Germans cross um, the main crossing point at Sedan um, is exactly. And I'm not saying just in the kind of environs of Sedan. It is precisely the same place they cross um, that they cross in 1870 and again in 1914. Yeah. You know, there are a few signals that are kind of yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Sa- saying that I mean, they might try it again. I mean, the traffic jam thing is interesting because because the, the NATO plan for the Cold War is that there would obviously be this enormous Soviet um, traffic jam in East Germany and they were going to nuke it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, that would certainly work in 1940. <laughs> anyway. Sure. Anyway, um, now, Philip Pike, he got in touch to say, a friend of mine from school went to the Tank Museum with his dad and his dad casually pointed himself out in a photograph of a bunch of lads sitting on a captured enemy tank. It was the first time his father had ever mentioned it. Isn't that just it's utterly beautiful. brilliant? Yeah. How amazing. But there is, there is I mean, there, there is the thing of never mentioning it, that, that, that there was a, a long, honourable tradition of people never, ever mentioning their war service. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Isn't yeah. It? People didn't talk about it. Yeah. I mean, maybe they didn't talk about it because it was horrible and that's the... the 
one of the things you've got to bear in mind is that the things he saw, he didn't want to revisit the revisit Yeah, but the I also think it's, I think it's more than that. I think it's also that, that everyone was in the same boat. And, you know, you come back from the war, you get demobbed, you get married, have your kids, get on with normal city yeah. life. And, you know, you're kind of just concentrating on the day to day. And you don't feel that your experiences are particularly special because so many other people yeah, are in the same boat. And it, it's yeah. only later on in life that you find people tend to start yeah. opening up. You know, the kids have flown the nest, you've got a little bit more time on your hands, you've retired. You know, someone says, come and join the kind of, you know, the squadron association. Yeah. You get there, it kind of prompts that kind of you know memories coming back to the fore again and, and that's when you find people typically start writing yeah. memoirs and yeah. all the rest of it but yeah. but yeah you're right um and i've got one for you al it's from mike bennett who actually i know mike he's um he's a volunteer at the chalk valley history festival um uh would dragons have tipped the balance either way <laughs> in t-day well I I uh, well, yeah done, yeah they? but you know you'd have an anti-dragon weapon wouldn't you i mean the, think of the ca- dragon mm. countermeasures you'd need <laughs> I mean, you probably, I mean, if you left like a lot of raw meat lying around, you might distract the dragon <laughs> temporarily from it, the dragon pilot. I don't know. Well, and as um, we discovered last week, we, we did have a dragon of sorts because we had a Churchill crocodile. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a dragon, with if it, if you get the angle right on a pier, you'd get a dragon, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, right, well, while we're being semi-facetious, here's a good way to start the show proper. Nick says, <laughs> and this is a question I think a lot of people want answering, right? Is there really any... Is there tr- any truth in the playground song of old? Did Hitler really have only one knacker? And in a quite brilliant piece of intellectual correspondence, Simon Shedd followed up Nick's qu- tweet with a more sim- with a simple question. More importantly, was the other ever in the Albert Hall? Because <laughs> it's Hitler's only got one ball. Goering is two, but rather small. Himmler is something similar, but poor Goebbels is no balls at all. That's yeah. the that's the full. Yeah. Stanza, isn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, Hitler did have two balls, but he had a thing called... <laughs> Straight in! He Straight did. in! He did, but, <laughs> but, but, but he sort of half didn't, because, and bear with me on this, he had a thing called cryptorchidism. Right. And crypt, he had right-hand cryptorchidism. And cryptorchidism is when your knackers don't drop into your scrotum. Really? You know, so when you're, when you're, when you're a nipper, obviously, the most yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, you're... You know, you, one ball up, one ball down. Uh, yeah, so he's one ball up, one ball down. What, but but uh, and this was discovered because after in 19, uh, 1923, of course, November nineteen twenty three was a beer hall putsch. After that, he was yeah. arrested, put in Landsberg prison. While he was in Landsberg prison, he was given a medical. medical, full medical cough. And the medical cough here. Cough, and, please, Mister Hitler. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. yeah, right. And um, and they discovered his medical records in twenty ten. Right. And that's where they discovered that he suffered from cryptorchidism. Fascinating. Yep. Yeah. Because there, there's lots of... The thing about Hitler... Uh, uh, um, the thing about Hitler. Listen to myself. You know what? Thing about Hitler, right? Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. The, the, <laughs> this, the, there are lots of, lots of these sort of, um, you know, myths and propaganda stories. Because that, that song is a Second World War song. It's not yeah. a playground chant. It's, a thing, it's yeah. a, a thing that men would sing on a march and that sort of thing. And ri- ribald soldierly humour. You know, yeah. In fact, actually sort of the, the, the digestible version you can sing with your mum in the house you know like uh, it, it's a lot usually a lot ruder isn't it but but there is a lot of there is a lot of stuff around Hitler and his personality and you know ideas uh, uh, often discussed was he gay um, what were his sexual relations really like and basically a lot of things that are, are kind of unknowable that surround him as a personality and uh, you know there's a there's a there's a myth that he uh, when he lived in Vienna, he got uh, a, a sexually transmitted disease from a Jewish prostitute, and that explains because people need they need to. That's ex- bollocks, though, isn't no, it? It's rubbish. It's just it's just junk. Yeah. But people need to explain it, don't they? So they they try and they try and put these stories on or yeah, sing, literally one ball explanations. That, yeah. That, that try and explain these enormous events and the complex politics. I mean, trying to take, bring it down to one testicle. Well, cryptorchidism, particularly if it's only right-hand cryptorchidism, or indeed left-hand cryptorchidism, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean you, you know, you, you yeah. can't do your stuff. Yeah. Um, it just means you're going to, you know, you've got less to go around. Yeah. But you only need one, don't you? And you chuck well, out I millions. Well, I suppose, but, but, but he, because there is the thing with his niece, isn't there, which is all... Yes, and we, that's I mean, very you know, weird. leaving his balls aside, there's the, there's the business of his niece, which is Geli Raubel, which is very, very strange. Very weird. Kills herself or yeah. otherwise in his flat in Munich and stuff. I remember a, 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 a story of, you know... When is that, 1928, 29? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And it was potentially massively scandalous. And yes. Did she kill herself? Was she murdered? All that sort of thing. And, f- and they lived together and it all very, very odd. And there's also there's this, a story of him, um, you know, Hitler's dating technique being quite peculiar. So he, he, there's a story of him, I think it's Geli Rauber. They go for a walk in the woods and he has, he has his dog with him. And what he does is he ties the dog up and beats the dog. 
as a sort of as this sort of you know metaphor um, for or opening gambit you know like oh, okay what sort of films do you like <laughs> rather than that rather than small talk he, he he ties the dog up and beats the dog weird and, and well yeah i mean it sort of it but re, kind of reassuringly weird you know what i mean yeah, you, yeah, yeah. what you want you want that in a way because i think a lot, a lot a lot of a lot of when people would try and sort of quantify hitler or 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 figure him out historically because of all the things that happened because of him they kind of need him to be mad and strange and perverted, don't they, in a, in a strange way? The, the, they do. Uh, but I, th- I think the reason why he is so kind of celibate after that, and, mm. and you know, overwhelming evidence suggests that, that he yeah. is, yeah. is is twofold. I think, think the whole thing with his niece shook him up. And I think yeah. once he becomes Chancellor, I think he, he sees himself as a kind of, you know, he's not just a Fuhrer, he's a kind of Messiah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the he's Messiah... He's married to Germany. He's married to Germany, and, you know, he's the father, you know, father but, figure. And, and and so he can't have another relationship because that dilutes from and, 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 um, what, he's, and what, course, what he's offering the German people. Yeah, and of course doesn't ma- right. marry Ava Brown until right at the end, right at the end, and... And, and it's a kind of a favour for, for for being so loyal all these that's years. That's right. And she's a sort of secret consort and all that sort of thing. It's all very. I mean, it's in, a, in a, you know, in a peculiar tangent. It sort of reminds me of pop stars who have to lie about being married. You know that 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 you know John Lennon had to keep his, keep his wife secret so that the fans would think he was still yeah. possibly available to them. It sort of it sort of got fame echoes of that. Because, yes. Because he did very much generate a sense of celebrity. Was really worried about. How he appeared, and you know, there's all those there's, there's famous photo plates of him trying the different moustaches and outfits and um, uh, different later hose and all this sort of thing. And 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 after the after he got out of um, out of out of prison, he made a conscious effort to appear more normal as, as he saw it. Yeah. To, to to dress more normally and. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, yes, and those little short moustaches weren't weren't kind of you know unique to him in those days. No. But but they are very very um, obviously it's an iconic look, isn't yeah. it? It will be a warped iconic look, and and you know he completely understood branding and yeah. image and yeah. being completely instantly identifiable and that's where the parting and the and yeah. the tash come in even though you know he's short-sighted and he's you know all the rest of it yeah. you know he never wears glasses a bit like John Lennon yeah. in um in <laughs> well only in that way only in that <laughs> only way in that listeners way. oh heavens above <laughs> but but no but the, but the sort of these ideas of the, the they were very much working on new media age ideas of fame, totally. of image, of branding, and of, of projecting uh, political ideas through that, yeah. which is you know, which is which is utterly fascinating. And, yeah. and when you look at Chamberlain, who's dressed like an Edwardian gent- gentleman yeah. in his top hat and all that sort of thing, you're you're you're, you're looking at a, like a political culture that simply hadn't caught up with any of that yet. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, you know, and Hitler, Hitler famously is the first person to use air power, to, uh, yeah. use airplanes, oh, air power again, um, airplanes to uh, <laughs> to elect- campus for, ele- for election, yeah, for election, and colour posters. They the first people to use colour posters. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, we have some Twitter questions. Uh, Axis and aliens asks. <laughs> right. Um, our wargaming club loves your podcast. Have you ever played any tabletop miniature World War Two games like Flames of War, Bolt Action, or Chain of Command? It's a fascinating hobby. Um, I haven't. Have you, James? No. No. But I did play Combat Flight Simulator once. Yeah. I kind of stayed up about three nights in a row, realised I needed Pervitin to get through the next, <laughs> and decided it wasn't for me. But I did have one of those um, joysticks that kind of yeah. shook when you when yeah. you fired the machine guns. Yeah. I played a lot of Call of Duty, the the old one, where you land, first of all, you parachute into Sam Mary and then yeah. you land a glider at Pegasus Bridge. And the idea that I wouldn't have played that, it's sort of absurd. But... Um, but um, uh, 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 I have flown. I want, once when I had a show in Wrexham. I was in Wrexham last week. I'm on tour currently, just in case anyone doesn't know. And we went to Wrexham, and the, one of the one of the guys there had set the flight sim up so you could fly a horser and uh, a horse glider. And um, he sat me down in the thing, and but out of Gatwick because that's what the software would let you do. So we so I was towed out of Gatwick, <laughs> po- to, poodled around Surrey. And then he let me go, and I basically every single time it just went. I just put it. N- 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 there was no possibility of landing anywhere. I just crashed it every single time. It couldn't fly the bloody thing at all. And he goes, "Yeah, it's a little, tri- little tricky because you've got no power. There's no throttle. You, 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 you know. Obviously, it's a glider, but um, but that's the. I think that I haven't done any war gaming. But thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Now, what what can you tell me? James and Al, what can you tell me about the Russian night witches? Were they as effective as legend says, William Mackenzie asks? Well, yeah. I mean, the problem they had was they were mostly flying biplanes. And obviously, biplanes in the middle of the 1940s weren't, you know, 
quite what they had been in the ni- 1920s or, yeah. or earlier. Um, but what is is absolutely un- indisputable is that they were incredibly brave. They were very effective pilots, and they were you know absolutely every bit as good as the blokes they were fighting alongside. Yeah, I met I, a, I met a night witch. Have in, you? Yeah, on, in 2004 when I did Road to Berlin, I, we, we interviewed one. We went to Moscow, and she lived in um, she you know she was in a. 70s then I think and she lived in a um, one of those giant blocks of flats that if, you, if you've ever been to Moscow no right so the uh, nearly the, but so not there's quite. The, the, you know obviously there's the there's the bit that you the, the bit when you go to Red Square it's, you think oh my god I've, I've been here before because you've seen it so many times it's like one of those really weird places where you think I've surely been here all before I know my way around because you've seen it so often and it's sort of like lucid how strange it is being there but vast stretches of Moscow these enormous blocks of flats from the 60s and she lived in one of those um, uh, uh, nice big, nice big block, nice big flat, boiling hot, heating, um, frightening lift to get there. Um, uh, medals, and she came out, and we and we filmed it out by the. There was a sort of uh, creek by the by the flat. So I remember being eaten by mosquitoes in the fading light as we interviewed her. But her whole thing was there was only one man in the squadron, and that was the squadron leader's driver. And there were all, everyone, everyone in it there were, were women. And she told this story about having to bomb her own village, um, take the plane up over, because, because it, the, you know, the, the, the front had swallowed up her village. And she had to do, a, you know, get up in the, in the biplane and, and attack the village she was from. And, you know, I feared I might kill my mother and father, but the fatherland, the, the motherland required it, you know. Wow. Um, absolutely unbelievable. Amazing. And And she was a tough old, Lady, Pretty impressive, in, in, really impressive, and you know, and and their thing. Her, uh, she was saying, well, if you're keeping them, if you're keeping the enemy up at night, you're disrupting what he yeah, can do. Totally, yeah. You're disrupting it, it, any plans he might have. You know, so well, although it's only biplanes, it's it's effective in itself as a as a sort of disruption operation, and that's what that's what they were doing. Mm. But I mean, you say biplanes, nothing wrong with a swordfish, James. <laughs> well. Yeah, no, no, I know. You know, it depends how you apply it, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, you know, great at Toronto, great on, yeah. the, um, great on the Bismarck. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, what happened to the captured French tanks of 1940? Were they used as training vehicles, destroyed for scraps, or used on the front, says Sihar? Uh, they were used. I mean, the Germans, um, the Germans nicked basically everything they could get their hands on. Because they were short of stuff. They were short of everything. And actually, famously, um, when the... Um, when the 82nd Airborne are, are at Lafayette, overlooking yep. the River Murdere on, on, on D-Day, um, a column of, of, of German tanks comes towards them. They're led by a Panzer Mark III, but following short behind are a couple of 1940 French tanks still being used. They also used a lot of the turrets as what yes. became known as Tobruks, which is where you kind of kick the turret off. You have it as a kind of, sort of armoured gun. You just plonk it in the ground. So there were lots of those along the Atlantic Wall. They used those as well. And they use them in Russia as well. I mean, you know, when, uh, when the German army went into um, Soviet Union on 22nd of June 1941 they went in with 2,000 different types of vehicle God, they were very smug about, about how much they'd captured and <laughs> you know all those you know we captured all this British stuff yeah. you know aren't we clever aren't we smart well yeah until you've got a sort of spares you know, manifest yeah right until you've got a sort of to tra- change the distributor cap or the new coil or well, you've got to go you know, down to euro parts for that lot haven't you <laughs> yeah I mean, <laughs> absolutely you got, nightmare have you got a coil for a, a bedford yeah and, 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 the, and the truth is you know operation barbaressa Arbor, operation barbaressa they have to win they reckon within 500 kilometers but actually realistically it's more like about 250 miles and they've got to win that because after that they reach what's known as their culmination point the culmination point is the point by which you can no longer operate in the way you want to because your chain of your supply chain is too long your tail is too extended mm. and what happens in the soviet union is that despite these incredible victories and surroundings of russian armies and all the rest of it they haven't got them all and by the autumn of 1941 the wheels are are literally starting to fall off yeah. and they can no longer operate with that that speed of manoeuvre um, that is so much their kind of USP um, and then they're just quite ordinary really Okay, which means I have to say what do you think of the idea that had um, the Germans not got themselves involved in the Balkans and delayed Barbarossa by seven weeks because the, 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 the people bring this up all the time and in fact I think we've, we've probably somewhere in the melee of the questions we've had I've certainly seen it asserted, you know, if they'd not gone to the Balkans, um, uh, Barbarossa would have succeeded. They did not rush out of the war. What do you, I, I mean, the face you're pulling, 
We can't, we need, you need to say something for the podcast, but I think I know what you're going to say. Well, I mean, Crete is just a total waste of time. And when you're, when you're doing global war strategy, what you've got to do is you've got to prioritize. Yeah. I mean, obviously you want to do everything at once and win and be kind of champions of the yeah. world. Um, but, but you can't do everything. And so it's a question of kind of working out what do you really need? What is most important? Well, the, the truth of the matter is, is they're running out of supplies. They're running out of everything. Yeah. You know, they've gone into, they've been like kids in a sweet shop or locusts on a field or whatever. Yeah. And they've just stripped the cupboard bare. By the spring of 1941, they're really seriously running out badly. There's no sign of Britain throwing in the towel. Um, the Americans are kind of sort of starting to gear up their kind of war industry. So they've got to move quickly, which is why they're moving into the Soviet Union in 1941, at least two years ahead of their pre-war planning. Yeah. And going into the Balkans is a big problem, but it also it shows to it shows to me that the strategic importance to Hitler of the southern flank. You know, everyone's kind of very poo-poo-y about the kind of, you know, the sort of allied strategy in the in the soft yeah, underbelly yeah. and all the rest of it. But but you've also got to look at it through the prism of your enemy. And your enemy is saying, you know, we think, I think, that the southern flank is really, really important, not least because of uh, Ploesti, which is the only yeah. source of oil, real oil, yeah. that the Germans have. And that's why they feel compelled to reinforce it. So I would say it's one of those big problems where they're already starting to get seriously shortchanged yeah. with, um, you know, they're, they're trying to do too much. They just haven't got enough of anything yeah. to do what they need to do. So they need to protect their southern flank. They need to make sure that Britain's kept at bay, but they also need to replenish their resources. The only place they can realistically do that, apart from the oil in Romania, is from the Soviet Union. So they haven't really got any choice, but they have got a choice with, I would argue, with Greece, and they've certainly got a choice with, definitely got a choice with Crete. Yeah. You know, they just do not need to go into Crete. And Crete is absolutely catastrophic for them, because although they win, it's definitely a Pyrrhic victory, yeah. because they lose, you know, they lose so many of their best train trees, but more importantly, they lose over 250 transport planes, yeah. which, boy, they're going to need once yeah, they're yeah, yeah, going yeah, to yeah. the so, 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 but Barbarossa, I still think Barbarossa would have failed even if they'd gone the seven weeks earlier and not gone into the Balkans. I think... Because, I, I, I because totally agree. They've just got no... Basically, their, their assessment of what the what the mission is and the scale of the thing they're taking on in it, with the Soviet Union, they've just not... They've, you know, it's an example of how bad German assessments of the rest of the world are. Totally. They're completely dependent on their panzer units. Yeah. They're, they're, so what one has to understand is everyone talks about the Nazi war machine, but the Germans aren't a, a, a machine, you know, only yeah. a small... The, the spearhead is. Yeah, yeah. So... The tip of it is, you know, they're completely dependent on boots on the ground, which is an incredibly inefficient way of fighting a war. Having, having a very boot-heavy, you know, infantry-heavy army really is not the way to fight a war in the 1940s. You want to use mechanisation and yeah. industrialisation and all the rest of it. Um, and so, although they only have, you know, of the 135 divisions they use in France in 1940, only 16 are motorised. Yeah. But actually, that's only gone up to about 30 by 1941. Uh, and for Operation Barbarossa... They only have seventeen mobile, you know, Panzer yeah. divisions. Yeah. You know, but seventeen Panzer divisions isn't enough when your front is ten times the size of it was a year earlier in against and it's France just and the It's much more difficult to punch a hole. It's much more difficult to. I mean, they do create encirclements. They do do all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and they do it but, very well. But it's just the sheer scale of the place. Because I mean, I, we're going to take a break in a moment. But I, I mean, what happens on the eastern front is you end up with these very strange strategic objectives because. One of the things I've been reading a book about Kursk, a German book about Kursk recently, really, really interesting. That one of the objectives of the Battle of Kursk, of, of Op Operation Citadel, the German pushing Kursk, was to capture enough prisoners of war to get into the slave labor system because Germany had run out of, of people to work. Yeah, it's because they'd, done, because they'd done so well out of um, the opening stages of Barbarossa with capturing prisoners who then became slave laborers. That they, that they, to keep the thing going, they needed another big battle where they could pick up another like half a million people to feed into the into Operation Todd, and they and and it, of course at Citadel that doesn't happen. They don't get the people, so that's one of the reasons that battle fails. Even though the Russian loss ratio, the Russians win that battle, losing six to every one German soldier lost, and they st and they still win that battle. It's absolutely the, the figures are just phenomenal, anyway, aren't they? Anyway, do you think this podcast will be improved by a cup of tea and a biscuit, James? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and Britain's greatest lost batsman, James Holland. Before we go any further, <laughs> um, uh, 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 wielding it like Excalibur, I wonder if you might indulge me for a moment. An interesting review. This is from someone called Fulham Away, who wrote, 
Really interesting podcast if you're interested in World War II history. If you're not, it's probably pretty boring. Well, I suspect that's about right. Yeah. I don't mind. No, it's fine. No, I mean, this is the, you know, the thing you learn as you, as you, as you enter your uh, middle age. But, you know, that, small acorns as well. I mean, well, you know, course, if, if we, we sort of trigger a kind of, you know, spark of interest in someone. Yeah, that's what you're hoping for. But not, not everything's for everyone. That's the thing you have to remember. That's the <laughs> 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 but to do, please rate and review our podcast and subscribe, of course. That's what we need. We need them numbers so we can go and do this from a yacht in Monaco. Right, now, James, <laughs> um, I understand you've got a new book out about the, uh, about, is it about Normandy? Oh, it is actually out. Yeah, it's funny you What's should it mention called? that. It's called Normandy 44, <laughs> D-Day and the Battle for France. I'm enjoying it um, enormously. Uh, I read the proof copy. Um, you gave me a copy and my father sent me a copy for my <laughs> birthday. So we're going to get rid of one of them. So, so well, in fact, we, we'll probably give one away. We might give one away. Yeah, I think we should. We'll give one away. We'll, we'll think of a. We'll think of a, we'll of a, of a the, good question. Yeah, the people who know how to do that, who are sat here mouthing at us silently, will figure that out for us now. Right, but here's the question: What was the single biggest revelation you uncovered researching the book? Because it's a story well told, but what's the thing that like really leapt out? Well, I think I think it's the very familiarity of the whole D Day Normandy story is where um, is what allowed a huge number of distortions to come in. Yeah, uh, and and you know obviously Hollywood plays its massive part. You know, you're thinking of, of Longest Day, you're thinking Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers, which you know I absolutely love to have to say, but you know it does distort how we view it. I think most people think that. Um, D-Day particularly was a kind of largely American affair. As you yeah. know, it absolutely wasn't. It was, you know, D-Day was probably dominantly British if you're going yeah. to come down on one side. I mean, it's yeah. a coalition effort. Um, but I think also, you know, that leads to a kind of sort of bigger kind of um, kind of thinking about how the whole campaign is fought. And I think one of, the, one of the problems with the narrative of the Second World War generally, but specifically in this case, D-Day and Normandy, is that the focus has always been on the guys sort of jumping out of the landing craft yeah. and, and or jumping out of their... their um, gliders or, or para- you know, jumping out of the, the Dakotas. Um, but I think there is this tendency to kind of really focus on the guys that are actually doing the fighting. And of course, that's because that's where the human drama lies at its heaviest and it's kind of the most interesting. But it also, again, kind of distorts how we view the Second World War. And I think you've got to understand that by 1944, the Allies and the Germans are fighting completely different types of wars. Yeah. You know, b- Britain and America and Canada and her allies are fighting kind of big war. They're fighting kind of long chain where the kind of the backup is absolutely enormous. They fought about literally everything from, you know, the the, the, the beach ordnance guy to um, the traffic control bike with his white gloves to, you know, having making sure Americans have enough Hershey bars, that we have enough cups of tea. But more importantly, things like that we've got enough tank wreckers, transporters, you know, so that we can do yeah. repairs in the yeah. field, all this kind of stuff. And also, I think the other thing that gets left out is that we're fighting a kind of tri-service campaign. We're yeah. fighting a war at sea, we're fighting a war in the air, and we're fighting a war on the land as well. And it's not just about guys sitting behind a hedgerow. And air power particularly is, I think, is one area that I think has really not been given the credit it deserves. And it's really interesting when you look at German testimonies, German diaries, letters, and, and kind of oral histories and all that kind of stuff, the one thing they go on about all the time is what a nightmare Allied air power was and how debilitating it was. But it's a morale weapon, principally air power, isn't it? Because when you look at anti-tank statistics from the Normandy campaign, the, your rocket-firing typhoon right, might well fill your trousers, but it won't necessarily um, actually do anything much to a Tiger tank, let alone let no. or a Panther or a Mark IV or a Mark III cause, or a Char B or, or a little Czech what Panzer or whatever, or your Renault, whatever. <laughs> because... because because th- th- that's one of the interesting things when you break that. Because the footage of a, of a typhoon coming, you think, "Holy hell!" Um, I wouldn't want to be in the receiving end of that. And air power is is so often a morale weapon as much as anything else. You feel dominated. You feel like you can't move. You feel like you can't get out your foxhole because there's planes bloody everywhere. And that's the the experience of the BEF in 1914 Normandy. Is where's the RAF? They aren't here. Whether the whether the Germans are effective in their application of the air power it's a morale weapon as much as it's anything else and that's definitely the case in normandy isn't it yeah i don't disagree with that at all but what i would say is that while they might be struggling you know rocket firing typhoon is struggling to shoot down a shoot out um a tiger tank they are destroying tanks and uh they are particularly 
destroying the soft skins. So yeah. what I mean by soft skins is, is the kind of support trucks. network, the yeah. trucks and all yeah. the rest of it. Uh, you know, the Panzer Lair, which is probably the best trained yeah. armoured, the best trained unit yeah. full stop in the entire Wehrmacht, is, is horrifically damaged on the way. You know, they lose something like 15% yeah. of their trucks just getting uh, to uh, the battlefront. Uh, and that's quite a big loss. Yeah. And the point about this is, is, is that, you know, if you think about a tank regiment, say, having kind of, you know, 800 men, something like that, or, or tank battalion, I should say, having about 800 men. Only 200 of those are in tanks. So 800 of those are support troops. So blokes with spanners. Blokes with spanners, yeah, petrol, you know. Spans all of stuff. Waffen, span of waffen, span of waffen, whatever. Exactly. And, and if, you're, if you're taking them out, once your tiger then goes kaput, which it yeah, does yeah. very regularly, because as we discussed, they're quite complicated, then you've got a real problem on your hand. And the point is, is the Germans simply cannot operate by day in, in, in Normandy because the moment they try and move anything up along those roads, they get to this kind of, you know, Yarbo Renstrecker, which is kind of fighter-bomber race course. Yeah. Uh, and the whole roads are just absolutely scenes of carnage. So I mean, cab, it's the, amazing. And the, so uh, Second Tactical Air Force is the cab rank thing that, 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 that that's developed in, in Normandy, where you, you, the, there would be typhoons in the air and you'd call them in. And, and, yeah. and, and, you, and down on the ground, you'd have a guy beetling around yeah. in an armoured car. Yeah. And, 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 a with, with a, with a, and a Cobra, um, the, the, the Americans figure that out as well. And you have yeah. a guy in a, in a tank with, a, with, a, with an aerial and, and he's bringing thunderbolts in. Yes, but he's got a pilot. There's a pilot in the yeah. lead tank yeah. who is talking directly talking through pilot Jeff, to pilot. Doing pilot, Yeah, doing pilot talk. Uh, and that... that just is brilliant. It's yeah. genius. And it sounds incredibly obvious, but it's, this is all brand new because, you know, close air support is being developed all the time in the Second World War, and particularly by, by the British and the Americans. So they're kind of really taking it to new levels. And, and all the guys, all the commanders are really seriously good. There's a the Mediterranean gang, as I call them, you know, mm. talking about sort of Mary Cunningham, Pete Casada, yeah. uh, um, Jimmy Doolittle, all these guys. They're just all, they're just hungry to develop and, well, and make it better. Because am I right in thinking in the desert that one of the big innovations, um, and you know, finally I get to say the word Monty. And one of the big, one of the big innovations when when Montgomery comes to Eighth Army is they put the Air Force tent next to the TAC HQ. Yes, but that is the suggestion yeah, of know, Cunningham I know, and, I know, and I, know, I know, I know, I know. But, but, and one that but, is but, poo-pooed by Auchinleck. Yeah, but is, it's just fascinating that yeah, the idea it? that you go, hang on a minute, wouldn't it be useful if we put the tents next to each other? We could actually... Fucking talk to each other. I mean, it's sort of. It's sort of yeah, I mean, the but thing do is, you know what? It's, it's sort of like the fork. You know, the, the, someone had to invent the fork at some point, didn't they? Yeah. There was a time before forks, and you, you know what I mean. It's like it might seem obvious to you and I that you'd need these people actually speaking to each other. But one of the big things, obviously, at the end of the first world, one of one of the things that happened, the RAF broke away from the army yeah. um, to, to get out of its clutches, basically. And so, so then the Second World War is there's a whole period of trying to get it glue the two things back together. Well, close air support, you know, because because the RAF emerges in the 1930s with these different commands. So yeah. they're all, you know, you've got coastal command, training yeah. command, bomber command, and all the rest of it, fighter command. Uh, and and what they haven't developed is a close air support kind of. Thing. Yeah. And, and and it's really found wanting in 1940. So thereafter, they're kind of trying to learn those lessons. And they're, they're being developed in the kind of major theatre yeah. where they're in operations, which of course is the Western Desert. Yeah. And, and the Desert Air Force comes into being. And um, Arthur Cunningham, known as Mary, um, Mary Cunningham um, takes over, I think, in, in November 1941 or October yeah. 1941, something like that. And he works very close in hand with Arthur Tedder, who is commander in chief of the RAF in the Middle East. Yeah. And they're both absolutely of the same. You know, yeah. they're speaking the same language. Um, and they recognise that what you have to do is you have to maintain that control. You have to decide what targets you're going to hit. So you ask the army to say, you know, I would like you to hit this song. And then you you are the judge of that. Yeah. And there's this big debate with the army commanders saying, no, no, we should be controlling it. And they're going, well, you don't understand it because we actually see a much bigger picture because we're up above. And actually, a lot of the time, you might want us to go and hit this particular tank or this 88 on this yeah. ridge. But actually, we're busy shooting up a column, which is going to be to yeah, your benefit later to, on. If that gets but, to you, yeah, yeah, you're really in trouble. Right, right, right. So we'll be the judge of that. And actually, Churchill is the arbitrator in this and backs the the uh, the airmen. And by the summer of 1942, they've really honed this. And um, Mary Cunningham is this incredibly charismatic kind of tactical fighter leader. I mean, yeah. He's really got big vision. But his sidekick is a chap called Tommy Elmhurst, who's his kind of admin officer, basically. And what he sets up is this kind of leapfrogging system um, where you have landing grounds prepared 
fed in the desert all the way back to Egypt yeah. and all the way forward again. Yeah. And they've all got their own dumps and supplies. What happens is the squadron takes off, hammers the enemy. And if you're in retreat, you then fall back to the next landing ground. Meanwhile, the ground crew have got into their trucks and moved off. And you're only yeah. talking about 10 or 15 miles or something. Yeah, yeah. And it means you can maintain that pressure at the front all yeah. the time. And it absolutely unquestionably saves um, 8th Army from annihilation as they're going back to yeah. back to Alamo. But, that's a, but, but, but there, that's a reflection of what you were talking about earlier, that the Allies are fighting this big operation of war. They have very deep pockets. Yes. Um, uh, they've got the stuff... And and also, you've not got a, a command structure that's necessarily being interfered with politically. I mean, you say Churchill's the arbitrator, but what you've not got is Goering going, no bombs will fall on Berlin, my yeah, yeah. don't worry, leave it with me. And then bombs fall on Berlin and, and he has to eat shit and, uh, uh, politically and, and, and all that going on. Or Hitler's only saying, I want you to go and bomb England again in yes, 1944 when it, it makes no sense it, to do it, so. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, but, but, but... but, but but we're not going to talk about air power anymore. You brought not? you brought something in, James. Oh yes, I have. I have. Yeah, this is this is an original nineteen um, uh, wartime battle dress. Um, still top. got it's the top. Not yeah, it's the, just the jacket, and it's always been rather ridiculed as kind of sort of being itchy and rough and and. Well, can I try it on? Yeah. And um, uh, uh, basically being a bit sort of risible. Well, it is itchy and rough. Yeah, but you know you've got, like you've, got, you've got an okay <laughs> you've got an okay Saturday morning itchy you've rough. got an okay um, shirt underneath. I mean, the point is 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 actually is re- it comes in in 1937 that that yeah. basic design, um, and the basis behind it is one again of extreme pragmatism. Yeah, because what they recognise is that um, in the 1930s and 1940s, your trousers come all the way up to your navel. Yeah, and so what is the point of having a jacket 19th century style, which it comes halfway your down your down your yeah. down your leg? It's just yeah. a waste of wool. And interestingly, you know, one thing that British um, is not short of is wool. Yeah. But what they're doing is they're trying to make savings, you know, save the pennies and the pounds will work for themselves. Yeah. Uh, And so it's rooted in deep pragmatism. And what that tells you is that we're no longer a militaristic state. We're a warfare state, but we're not a militaristic state. So actually looking the part isn't really the point. Whereas for the Nazi, Nazi Germany... The look is everything because yeah, it's part the, of the image. It's the part snaz of, the, of it. Yeah. The snaz of it, exactly. You know, and Hugo Boss and all the rest of it. But, but what this is saying is we are just looking at this pragmatically. So and a, actually what it's got is lots of room under the arm so that you can crawl yeah. and lift up your rifle really easily. It's got huge pockets on the inside and out. Yeah. You've got on the trousers, you've got a massive patch pocket on your thigh. So that's more, more room for storing stuff. I actually had to, I was doing some filming for PBS a, a little while ago, and I had to do a kind of 15-mile route march in full kit. And actually, I wasn't wearing one of my battle dresses, but I was surprised by how comfortable it was, actually. It was fine. And it, so, and this is, I mean, to look at it, it, it is, I mean, it is, it is. A, it's cheap and cheerful. To, well, to, uh, and, but, and to modern taste, this is a, 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 you know, rough and ready garment. It is, it is itchy wool that we're all not used to anymore. It's, ca- it, and it's khaki. This is a classic khaki colour. And what are these badges? So we've, um, the Durham's, at the top. Yep. And then, the t- so he was obviously in one of the Durham um, regiments, uh, one of the battalions. He's a major. Uh, yep. That's the Tyne T's divisional patch on it, which yep. is disbanded in, I think, August, middle, late August 1944. And on the other side, that's the Armoured Corps. Yeah. Um, so I would imagine that um, they, he was infantry, um, uh, infantry battalion, one of the DLIs. And then yeah. um, you can see the, the Wessex Wyvern, so he moved into 43rd yeah. Division. And I suspect they were attached to an armoured um, armored brigade at some point. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is, is you, do then, you, do, uh, you do then get a sort of a slight to and fro with uniforms, don't you? Because, because you get, you get uh, the sort of Paris smock which comes along uh, later in the war, which mm-hmm. is kind of like the Falchium Jaeger smock, which does go o- o- over your over your over your bum, basically. Well, necessarily, because otherwise it's going to put up. Because if it's not long enough for which yeah. you have it, because what the the Par- what the Falchium Jaeger one, the German one does, is yeah, it, buttons you, around you, your legs, buttons yeah. around your legs. Yeah. Yeah. But but the British one, you have this this tail, this flap that comes yeah. up between your legs, and you you button, button it on. on. But if it's not long enough, you won't be able to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, that's big pockets and all that sort of yeah. thing. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean the, the the thing is, is this was this modelled on like skiing, like a. Sk- I seem to remember reading anything about it's like modelled on ski wear or something. Well, it's interesting. I did a huge amount of research trying to find uh, on all uniforms, and there was lots and lots and lots about the development of the American uniforms, but absolutely none that I could find about the British ones. And um, you know, the the fact is, is you know, a lot of 
documents were just destroyed. You know, yeah. they're not in queue anymore. It's a waste 34 to 36. It doesn't fit me. Um, uh, uh, the bre- oh, right, so it's a, it's a breast of 39 to 40. I'm a 44, that's why it wouldn't go on. Um, I can't quite read the rest. It's sort of faded. So the, would, would manufacture this would be outsourced all over then? All over, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's just... What I, what I love about it is just the, the pragmatism of it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just saying, OK, let's try and make a jacket that is completely durable. Wool is good because it's fire resistant as well because it has national, you know, has yeah. natural kind of oils in it and stuff. Um, they're made all over the place. Americans make them for us. The Canadians right. make them. Australians make them. We've got wool all around the empire and, and so on, and the Dominions producing wool. We've got vast, you know, 24 and a half million sheep in Britain itself. Yeah. You know, so wool is not something we're short of, um, nor is cotton. So that's cotton lined and stuff. It, if you look at the collars and on the inside of it, the stitching is just, it, it's really done, but there's no finish to it. And yeah. w- what's the point? You yeah. know, you, what you want to do is just churn out zillions of these incredibly cheaply and incredibly quickly. It's all about efficiency. And, and as I say, you know, if you can make these cheaply, then you're making savings that you can spend your money elsewhere on developing cavity magnetrons and, you know, amazing navigational aids yeah. and a whole host of other stuff. The other stuff you need. Whereas German uniforms, were they, they, made, of, they were made of cotton, weren't they? So, well, so, they're, made of, they're made of wool. wool. And, and oh, you know, right. interestingly, I can't remember if I've said this already, but, you know, they have 4.5 million um, sheep and 24.5 million pigs. Britain's got 24.5 million sheep and 4.5 million pigs by some strange quirk of nature. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, they don't have a lot of wool. Yeah, but and they, yet, they have. They make these incredibly kind of complicated jackets and so if only, uniforms. If pigs had wool, the, the outcome of the Second World War might be different. <laughs> well, they they might have had access to a little but, bit more. So wool. German wool outfit, uniforms made of crackling. Well, well, I'll tell you what. Another podcast. <laughs> let's look at a German jacket. But I mean, you know, they're things of beauty. I mean, yeah. you know, compared to compared to the battle dress, they're absolutely amazingly um, tailored. Brilliant. Well. Thanks for bringing that in. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this week. James has got books to sell. He's got one out um, at the moment. Uh, and I've got gags to crack. I'm on tour, um, if you want to just Google it. Um, but fear not, we'll be back next week with more of your questions and plenty of myths to bust. Yeah, do please contact us on Twitter using the hashtag WeHaveWays. Questions, observations, corrections. You know, we're not, In particular, we're not, uh, corrections. Yeah. Old photos, maps, favourite songs, worst films. All correspondence is welcome. Absolutely. See you next time. Cheerio.